Hi everyone, my name's Kay and I work at Screen Skills. Welcome to our free online training. We're delighted you're all joining us today for this Lunch with the Commissioner session with Pete Andrews, Head of Sport at Channel 4. The session is chaired by Jilly Cohen, who is our Director of Learning and Development here at Screen Skills. Thank you, Kay. Well, Kay took a lot of the words right out of my mouth, so that's made it a lot easier for me, so I don't have to tell you anything at all. We're really, really lucky to have Pete with us today. He's given up quite a lot of his time um, for us today, so let's not waste any more time and let's say welcome to Pete Andrews, who Kay has already said is Head of Sport at Channel 4. Thank you very, very much, Pete. So can I just first ask you, one to introduce yourself and just let everyone know what shows you're currently looking after. Sure, yeah, so uh, hi everybody, thanks for, thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, my name's Pete Andrews, I'm Head of Sport for Channel 4. Um, I previously worked at ITV when I started, then I did uh, nearly 15 years at the BBC. I've been at Channel 4 since uh, March. Um, my previous experience actually was as a sport director, like an outside broadcast and stuff. So it's been a real interesting sort of switch for me, really. Um, lots to learn. I've really enjoyed it. A uh, real challenge. Um, currently, I look after Formula One. Not a lot, not a lot of stuff happening at the moment um, for Channel 4, uh, Formula One, uh, the Paralympics, all the Paralympic sport we do, um, the racing series uh, for female drivers called W Series, uh, some international rugby, some uh, European Cup rugby as well, club rugby with the Heineken Cup, um, and sort of many other little projects uh, on the Channel 4 Slate Crafts. I think I can say wow. Channel 4 is the, yeah, I think, I think Channel 4 is probably unique in seeing Crafts as a sport, but uh, we do enjoy it, comes under me, and uh, you know, we, we thought about trying to give it back, but actually it's been quite good fun. I, I do like dogs, so we'll, we'll hold on to that one. Um, yeah, and so that, those things are all under my remit at the moment. Obviously, quite a difficult time for sports uh, with things not happening. Um, so that's obviously been a bit of a challenge for us, and a lot of the stuff we're doing at the moment is really looking at what happens when the sport comes back, how it comes back, how that affects how we cover it, et cetera, what happens. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing at the moment. Thank you very much, Pete. I think let's rewind, rewind. And can you tell us about how you got your first break in TV? What was your route in? And really what made you want to work in TV? Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I was extremely lucky, actually. I think um, my sister was trying to get into television and I was a little bit lost, not really sure what to do with myself. She went for a job uh, at ISN, which was ITV Sport, London branch, um, got the application form, uh, realised it was about football, sent it to me. I did it. Uh, I think we had to write an advert. I think it's the advert that got me an interview. I got an interview. Uh, there were, there were eight, I think. I didn't get the job, um, but they then desperately needed someone in Birmingham. So at the time, the ITV local network was quite strong. This is sort of 1997. Uh, Birmingham needed someone yesterday, and they basically just put me straight in. Um, so, I mean, I, I was, it was an absolute golden you know, arrow. I mean, I was so lucky. Um, didn't really have the required experience, didn't really, but I just then had to work extremely hard. I'd been there two weeks and I was at Newcastle, Barcelona in the Champions League and I felt like I'd won the lottery. And it's then, dream you know, job. oh, it was a dream job. And I hadn't, to be honest, I wasn't, none of the family did telly. I wasn't really aware. And I was that much of a sports geek when I was a kid that when we did get a video player, I would sit and record all the goals to make my own goals tape, which I know is really sad. But then when I started working, I was responsible as you start off in sport for making all the goals tapes. And I was like, oh my God, you get paid for doing this. You know, I didn't even know that jobs existed. I didn't know they were there. They had me doing 13 day fortnights. They had me working all the hours. Um, but that, you know, I mean, I loved it. I loved it. Um, and the good thing about starting somewhere very small, because it was kind of a, like a local station is at that time, the Premier League would, would um, give small companies their coverage so now I sort of started when I was 21 and by 26 I was directing football basically there's there's a really small team there's no one else to do it and suddenly you're directing football and um I was doing that at 26 which, which was amazing for me and just kept working ended up at the BBC uh you know moved to Salford 
that's the other thing. I think I think my path was also cleared by that I went to Salford. A lot of people who had been at the BBC for a long time didn't. So then yes. I just started getting more bigger, bigger directing jobs. Ended up running Wimbledon, directing the boat race, directing Olympics, all that sort of stuff. So I was really, really lucky. Um, just from that one bit of luck, that one, that really one amazing. star. Can, yeah, can you remember was, the advert that you wrote? Yeah, do you know, I think my advert was actually, again, that's the other surprise thing, it was a bit of a cheat, a copy of an army advert where people would sit under a clock, um, really bored, and then there was a cut to like the army, join the army, and I think mine was just like people sitting under a clock, really bored, and then it was a cut to football, watch Carlton Sports Special on a Wednesday night, you know, so it's sort of a bit of a parody of that, um, and it was that, that's what got me into the room, because actually I hadn't, I hadn't been motivated enough uh, a bit of a fraud really to do any experience or work experience so I guess I wasn't really aware of television I guess if your parents don't work in it if you don't it just seems so far away uh, especially in those days you're just totally not aware of it at all and I had no awareness I knew I loved sport and I loved watching sport but I had no awareness that you could be part of it so I was really really lucky. So was it sports programs you enjoyed most growing up or was it a broader Diverse all sorts of things I think my favorite program would have been match of the day I think again not very original um so yeah but the old comedy and all sorts I mean I like everybody else you know a broad spectrum of stuff but my experience is all sport my tv experience is all sport a lot of live mostly live and a lot of directing and stuff but so I don't I don't have a broad tv experience I've got a very 20 year highly detailed sports experience do you play any sports do you think that's important to play sports if you work in sports no i think we're all failed players aren't we i think we, we <laughs> did it we watched it because we couldn't play it i'd love to i'd love to i've got no talent whatsoever i wish i i wish i did but i haven't i'm rubbish <laughs> and <laughs> most of going, us are. <laughs> if we're thinking about your own cv what would you say you're most proud of producing and or commissioning Blimey. and why? Um, well, I think, I think producing wise, just briefly, I think, you know, when you get to direct finals of stuff, that's really big, you know, and you feel that pressure on your shoulder, especially live TV. I think um, the first Wimbledon singles final I did, or men's singles was Murray winning in 2016, which was obviously big. Wow. And you just want to get that moment right when he wins. And obviously you, we, we cut the cameras ourselves as well. So there's no hiding place. I think, I think that morning I must have gone to the toilet about 25 times and I just had it. I could mess this up for everybody. You know, I really felt it, but um, it went well, you know, and then I did another couple after that, I think, um, you know, so all, all of those directing, you know, you know, if you direct live sport, you're only ever 10 seconds away from disaster. So, you know, you're on the wrong thing when something happens, you miss it. And so you have to be quite philosophical and you have to really rely on the team and the camera crew and they make you look good. And sometimes they make you look bad, but they are brilliant. They more often make you look good. So you just have to be quite philosophical about everything. It makes you very, in a way, relaxed because you, you have to be comfortable being out of control. And I think all of those things, you know, that appreciation of and, and lots of live, you just got to be calm, you know, all of those things. So uh, I think I think that probably the Murray finals, the big one, I think Olympic rowing was great because we we're in such a great location and doing it for the whole world and then lots of great football games and, and this that and the other and I think commissioning wise it's got to be the cricket world cup final because I think you know we we the what the first thing we did or the thing the thing channel 4 we talked to me on the phone before I joined was about was the highlights for the cricket world cup and it's really interesting digital rights uh everyone's very interested in digital rights and no one had picked up the highlights and I think it was a, wow. one thing, it was a bit of a, there was a feeling maybe highlights were sort of dead. It's all about live. It's all about digital. And I think the BBC went digital. And, and uh, so Channel 4 picks up the highlights and that puts in a great position as England got closer, you know, and on the Thursday, England played Australia in the semi-final. And we knew that if England made the final, it would be on Channel 4 and Sky. Um, I've never been so nervous in my life. So I think, and it was Sky coverage, brilliant Sky coverage and, and um, the partnership. But I think I'd, I'd been in three months and at that time I thought, this is probably the pinnacle for me. <laughs> I should probably leave because the game just delivered, delivered, delivered as the best cricket game ever. And it was on Channel 4, although it was, it was Sky. 
and Channel 4, you know, and we have to say a massive thanks to them. But I think from our point of view, it was like, I can't believe it. I can't believe, you know, we're part of it, really. So is there anything that you'd have liked to have, even a big sporting event from the past that you'd have loved to have produced? Or is there something that you'd love to see in the future that you'd like to produce or commission? Uh, well, I, I, it's a diff, that's a difficult one with sport because obviously you, you want to do the biggest sports possible. And I think, you know, the home for a lot of those is either with a pay TV broadcaster who has the, the time to go in depth and, and the money to buy those rights or it's with the BBC, the national broadcaster that, that can show it to everybody. So, you know, you kind of feel for Channel 4, it's about just being smart and boxing clever and partnerships and working with other people or developing sports. I mean, so Channel, Channel 4 did the Women's Euros in 2017 and then that sort of got the BBC interested to pick up the Women's World Cup in 2019 and, and brought it forward. And the thing for us is to, if we get something and sort of launch it, not to let someone else then steal your thunder, <laughs> try and keep it next time, try and stay on with it, you know, and, and um, try and look to be part of as many big sporting events as possible because we would do them in a slightly different way and, and hopefully bring them to a slightly younger audience, I think, which is what we're all about. So, yeah, well, the World Cup final, <laughs> but I don't think that's happening anytime soon. So... Yeah. So let's move on a bit to the impact of the coronavirus. I mean, clearly it's a crazy time for everyone and schedules are out the window. You know, priorities, strategies are changing on a daily basis. Um, I appreciate that. But perhaps you could share with us and the audience some of the areas you're most interested in receiving ideas about. Um, and is there, I know that you do receive um, pitches from Indies. Is there any anything you definitely don't want pitched at the moment i think it's difficult at the moment um in a sporting sense i suppose the first caveat to put it across things is rights so i think if you're in the corona crisis at the bbc for instance or maybe at sky or you know uh, bt i think if you have a existing portfolio of sports rights you know you can make programs based on the rights you've got i think as channel four we obviously don't have that big portfolio of sports rights. So I suppose sort of actually the stuff you would want to do is, you know, look back at great Grand Prix or look back at let's, let's see the cricket world cup final again, all these, you know, all of these things we are not able to do because we don't have, excuse me, the rights to the footage. So I think that is, I think when, if you're pitching to sport and it involves sports content, it's definitely worth thinking about the rights element. Because I think, you know, we've had some very big quotes on, I bet I'll mention what they are, but say to, to run a good sporting event or a, a repackage of a sporting event. And let's say the cost of the rights is 80, 90,000 pounds just makes it impossible. So I think, I think before you pitch, you, you need to know the rights position on what you pitch and who owns okay, what. Because so it could be that. amazing. We've had lots of amazing ideas and the rights position is, oh, actually those rights are owned by someone else, which means we can't make that program. You see okay. what I mean? It's a very yes. easy answer for me, but it's a shame if people have put a lot of time into stuff. Yes. Um, and that, I suppose that is the thing with sport. If it's a sport based program or you, it, obviously if you're not going to show the footage, you're okay, but it, otherwise it, the rights issue can be difficult. Interesting. Um, and has, the, the coronavirus actually changed what you're commissioning in the here and now? Um, well, I suppose at Channel 4 in general, I think the sports department is very much an event focused department. So, you know, we, we are sort of, we will do obviously all the Grand Prix programs, the Paralympics when it happens, a lot of disability sport. But I think mostly our remit, our budget um, is to cover the events. So we're live events and we're quick turnaround highlights, packaging and things. So I think when we're looking at um, documentary stuff and those ideas, there's probably only a limited amount that we have the money to make, if you see what I mean, because most of our focus is on the live event. And obviously we do, when rights bids come out, we would, if we want to buy the rights, we would do a lot of stuff to try and convince that rights holder that Channel 4 is the right person for the rights to be there. And we would also want to be, 
um, you know, pitching to them and trying to win sports rights for Channel 4. So I think we're very much in the winning sports rights. And then once we've won the rights, then making the programmes about those. So I think the four programmes outside of all of that, I think the other stuff that we do remit is we try and either look at disadvantaged sports, sports that, you know, the, the whole point channel four is here, you know, we have a huge play in sort of disability sport, but what other sports are not being picked up by everyone else? What programs can we make? But I think, you know, if it then comes to something on, um, let's say, uh, quite a big sport that we don't have rights to, yes. um, you know, that, that is, um, probably tricky and then if it's say it's a, a documentary it might actually be that although it's about sport the documentaries department is the best place to go if you see what I mean okay interesting and I think um you having spoken although so we will help it, although we will help will, I mean you know we're, we're, we're massively help you know we um we we would we co-pro on stuff at times and we would take ideas to the other departments because I realized that we're um. probably a bit easier to reach sometimes and so we would you know get the inside track okay uh quite a few comments there pete on a great sizzle um yeah, we like that thank you very much i think everyone enjoyed that you, any yeah. particular favorites on there for you well i think i think the point of that and we we sort of commission that that's you know between us that's what we send when we're trying to get rights tv rights and uh you know i think i think hopefully what comes out of there is sort of the Channel 4 way, the Channel 4 feel. I think it's all about casting. I think, you know, uh, putting Billy Munger into the Formula One, you know, seeing, you know, him as a double amputee, you know, so visible, um, doing sort of things like the women's football, all of our presenters that we've been working on, bringing on sort of for the Paralympics. Um, it's just about making sure that we, we cast properly and well and in a really way that just includes everybody. And I think we feel that, that the audience you know, really appreciates that. And I think you know, like some of the, like Gareth Thomas comments and things like that, you know, it's what we're all about really at Channel 4 is to, is to just be as inclusive as possible and, and maybe take a look. Uh, Paralympics is a really good example of something that, you know, in the nicest possible way was kind of always seen when it was at the BBC um, as not second class, but essentially they would do the Olympics and then they would stay and do that. Um, and I think, um, you know, what Channel 4 did with the Paralympics, just to be unashamedly and say, well, look, this is the main event, come join us, you know, made a huge difference, I, th I think. And that's why we're, it's, you know, it's probably the biggest thing we do, I think. Um, just in general, whatever sport we do, that one's still the most important. Uh, and that's for the whole channel, you know. So uh, it's, it's kind of the biggest challenge, especially now it's been delayed by a year. So um, we were just ramping up. We were just like really ready to go. And now we've just had to put the brakes on. Suddenly it's 17 months away um and reset a little bit yeah yes, i agree so yeah mm. coming back to that about the effect of the coronavirus it, at now at this particular moment are you looking for fast turnarounds um no we're not at the moment um i think because a lot of our stuff is rights based or um i think i think we are gonna we're gonna try and do some stuff to excuse me, sorry, to, to sort of commemorate where the Paralympics would have been. So I okay. think, you know, we, we want to keep it in people's minds. And I think we want to, everyone to know that it's been delayed by a year, if you see what I mean. Um, but I think in general for us, it's a lot more about how we restart when the sport restarts, because I think, and the reason for that, I think is not because we wouldn't want to do things, but I just suppose where we are at the moment, um, sort of quick turnaround ideas that come into sport um they would probably need to be quite because everyone's stuck in the houses you know they would need to be quite archive based it's something we don't have and and the, what the channel can do with so many other things it feels like the priority of the channel should be elsewhere in the sense because yeah. you know that's where a lot of the skills lie but without the rights it's very difficult for us to make much sporting program at the moment so then how how could you give freelancers any advice about how best to use their time at the moment to develop and prep for when commissioning ramps up again um well i think i think it's it's actually quite nice sometimes to take a step backwards and have a look and sort of come out of the bubble i suppose if you are just on a treadmill of ideas 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 and 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 what comes forward and what you can do is there is a bit of a reset and i think also corona 
is going to change what happens. I think there'll be a lot of sports behind closed doors, which makes things difficult, as we've seen, you know, with some entertainment programmes, you know, how much they miss the crowd. I'm sure that'd be the same with sport, you know, football matches with no crowd or rugby or, you know, maybe Formula One, not quite so much. It's all about the cars. But, you know, I think, I think it's really difficult, isn't it? I think, you know, it's a difficult time um, and things are changing. But I certainly think if it's all about what I would be thinking about what the world's going to look like when it opens up again and what sport's going to look like when it starts again, which I think probably isn't going to be exactly the same for quite a while. So, you know, I guess it's trying to think what's appropriate when it happens, probably. That's probably not very so helpful. So, Pete, do you Sorry. think that means changes for you um, in what um, you're on the other side? Yeah, I, again, I think the slight difficulty is that our, our commissioning changes are probably quite rights-based as well. So there's quite a, what's been interesting uh, and what, again, without getting too geeky sports rights, you know, the Six Nations and the Autumn Internationals process just stopped. I mean, that, that's for the next set of Six Nations Internationals. Um, and I guess it's for us to work out where we sit in that or can we sit in that or what we're doing, you know, and the next women's football set of rights as well, you know, not, not coming out yet. But I think there's a, you know, not those rights, I don't think will cost what they cost before, you know, and I think, you know, that there is that the big, um, there's a lot of things that will change, I think, in the business of sport, in, you know. Um, so for us, I think it's, it's, just, it's just trying to work out what's going to happen, what it's going to look like. And what our place in it is really and then for the things we're, we're doing with the Paralympics it's you know just pausing for now while everyone stopped and then just reanimating as quickly as we can making sure that we use the extra year to make it even better you know it's the things that we're running out of time to do we've been given another year you know um, and but again some of the things we're doing in a new corona world <laughs> we probably need to tweak we probably need to change we probably need to adjust um, some of the stuff we were going to do and, you know, some of the athletes might retire that we were going to go big with. They've got a decision to make. Do they want to do another year? Um, new stars will be born um, and all of that sort of stuff. So I think I think there's, there's so much to happen. Um, it's just staying nimble and seeing what's going on. Yeah. Great. Quite a few freelancers are telling us that they're using this time to brainstorm ideas. Um, so can I ask Pete what your top tips are for working ideas up and getting them down on paper or even creating pitches and sizzles tasters in this period? Yeah, so I'm a bad brainstormer, actually. Because <laughs> I like my own opinions. <laughs> I'm not so keen on everybody else's. So I suppose the first thing is just to be collaborative. And I think to take feedback, and I think the temptation is to take feedback and just, oh no, I don't agree with that. Uh, take the good stuff and leave the bad stuff behind. But I think everybody's feedback is worthwhile. And sometimes even family members who don't understand what you're doing, sometimes will ask questions that actually, actually, yes, that's a really good question. So I, I, would, I would almost, I don't think you need to talk to people you need to talk to people in the industry and who know what they're doing but at the same time talk to people who aren't you know like everybody's mum asks really annoying questions but sometimes they're right you know including mine <laughs> um and you don't want to hear it but you know i think i think a, a canvas a wide variety of opinions and do believe in your own ideas and do believe in yourself but just make sure that you're not suddenly realizing that everyone's telling me this is a bad idea but i'm going to go for it anyway because that probably is the wrong thing to do. And, it, and it's so easy to become convinced of your own ideas. So easy. Um, and I think it's, you know, if, if you're sort of thinking, I know, I know I'm right about this, you probably should try and cut something together so that maybe you can explain it better or you can demonstrate it better because you have something that explains it. I suppose when you look at that Channel 4 sizzle reel, the, the, the point of that, the editorial point of that was to try and explain what Channel 4 Sport looks like and what kind of things we talk about and, and a bit of humour and a bit of casting and a bit of, you know, and maybe sometimes it's better seen than written down and, you know, but I'm a bad brainstormer, I'm impatient. And, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't take my advice on brainstorming. I'm working on it, I need to get better. There, there was some good advice there, I mm. thought. Um, let's go a bit deeper into the commissioning process for you. Yeah. Um, 
Can you tell can you tell everyone what the best way to pitch to you is? I.e., do you prefer a single top line over email? Or do you prefer a more detailed approach with a oh, more a developed top, treatment? A uh, single top line, definitely, because I think then you can save a lot of time. Um, because I like to, I actually like to talk to people face to face. I like to speak to them on the phone. Um, I think. Um, I would, all, I mean, even if you, even if you do a single top line, which is then backed up by a treatment, you know, make sure that I suppose it's like, it's kind of like a headline, isn't it? Or clickbait or something. You want people to read more. So, you know, you, you don't want to be revealing the great thing at the bottom of a page because you probably got to think that commissioners might not read all the way to the bottom of the page. They might make quite a big, uh, quite a quick decision. So, you know, I even do that if I'm trying to get the attention of my bosses, I'll write, in the subject letter of the email, the most appealing thing about it when I email it. So, because I, I'm like, right, I want you to read this and I want this to get to you. So I'll write, this will get a million viewers and then send it like that, you know? So, or something, <clears throat> I've never have written, but that sort of thing, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think you should ever worry about selling yourself or selling your idea. And I, I think if you're a person who's quite polite or doesn't like to talk yourself up, I think it can feel awkward to start with something that says this is going to be brilliant but I always say that I would all I would do that anyway because you've got to think if I have only got a minute I want the minute to be the best stuff if you see what I mean I, and I think uh, you know if let's say we had something sent in that the the top line was really interesting you then read the more detail because you want to know you know and if the top line isn't doesn't grab you you probably don't read the detail <clears throat> so I'd be unashamedly um, uh, forthright with it. Even it, it doesn't come naturally to everybody, uh, but I think if you if you're that kind of person, they will see the sincerity in it. If you know what I mean, I, I wouldn't worry about you know. So, yeah. Can you that, tell that us? You can. Yeah. Can you tell us about some of the most standout pitches you've ever received? Um. Well, I think I think a really good pitch again it doesn't have to be um there's two things i think if the idea is really good i think that can grab your attention and i think the other thing if the sizzle's really good i think that gets you excited and i think obviously those two things together sometimes you might think oh i'm not sure about that and then you watch the sizzle you think oh yeah that looks really exciting that looks great or you know the depth of emotion in something where it's like a, a sizzle where you you maybe don't know the story but sometimes when you see it you really understand it. So I think it's all about the best taste of material you can find um, and just telling the story. Because sometimes you might be in a situation where, oh, let me try and think of a good example. Um, I guess it was always like trying to, trying to get, I don't know, like my wife interested in football or something where I might say, oh yeah, but that person there, they broke their leg two years ago, or they, they've got nothing or that, you know, it's all about with sport, actually people who don't like sport don't always realize the amazing stories of sport you know and the storylines and you know or if there's a mystery you know people love mystery what happened who did it and i think all of that can open up the story is the key you know storytelling is the key and it can get you interested i know i remember the bbc did uh when i was at the bbc they made a program about the man united players taking over salford city and it just so happened on the fa cup um uh, the BBC, the next game was um, Salford in the first round of the FA Cup and it got three and a half million viewers, which was the most watched football game to date that November, more than Premier League, more than all this stuff, because um, everyone, people who'd watched the documentary <laughs> wanted to know what happened to the team. <laughs> they didn't necessarily like football. They, they, they bonded with the hot dog lady and the, the groundsman <laughs> and they watched the game, you know, and that's sort of, that's quite a good, it's all about storytelling always even sport even everything out yeah so i mean you know it that you know the bbc then picks off it again for round two which was a bit dodged but they saw the viewing figures <laughs> and they went for it again so um yeah i mean storytelling is the key so if you if you can put your top light your big editorial early on it helps yeah. So we don't want you to name and shame, but can you flip and try and think of any examples when a pitch hasn't gone well and why? 
Well, I once got emailed, um, and it's, again, the tagline of the email, which is, like, which is a good thing, was the most original idea you'll ever get. So I was like, oh, okay, oh, well, okay. it's a big build up. But then when I read the idea, I was able to send them three, with one Google, three versions of the same thing. And, and just say, well, I'm not sure, have you seen these? And I think what I thought then was, so those guys have gone to all the detail of writing up a pitch for me, but they haven't Googled their own idea. In other words, if they Googled what they were planning for a program, they'd realize it had been done at least three times before. So I think that shows you, it was a bit like, you know, when you're interviewing people, you know, and if you say, oh, have you watched much of our content? And they say no, then you're like, well, you haven't prepared for the interview. <laughs> you haven't prepared for the pitch. You haven't prepared for the, you know, you haven't done your homework. You haven't done your research. And I think if you see a pitch that hasn't done its homework, you throw it out because you've only got a certain amount of plays and everything you, you green light has to be the best of what you've got. And, and in a way, you've got to make sure you've covered all that off. What if this? What if that? And you need answers to those things. And if someone you go to all the trouble to write that pitch, but they hadn't Googled the idea. It's like, well, so in that case, would you ever have time to give feedback? Or is that a ridiculous question? Oh, yeah, I, I, I like to try and give feedback if I can. Again, I, I don't think I get as many pitches as the as other commissioners because of sport being sport and sports rights being sport rights. And often the feedback is can't get the rights. I'm really sorry. Um, and we will investigate if we want to do stuff. Um, but yeah, we'll try and give feedback if we can, even if the feedback is we just we can't do that at the moment. We're focused on something else. You know, I think we a lot of the stuff when we gave feedback from January to this year to pre Corona was, do you know what this year? I like the idea. We're really focused on the Paralympics. So, you know, let's talk about it in October um, because we're just narrowing down on the ideas that help us promote Tokyo, you know, and I think that, so, so, you know, sometimes the feedback is really good. We'd like to do it, but we can't, you know, but I think, um, yeah, I always happy to give feedback. And, and as quickly as possible, because you don't want people wasting time on something. And something I learned quite early on was a quick no is often appreciated, which feels bad. But actually, the more you do it, the more people say to you, do you know, thanks. OK, I, I, now I'll take it somewhere else. Or even if they don't agree with you, this nice bit of finality on it can't be done. OK, what do I do next? That helps, I think. And I'm sure there's people that you are probably having well, virtual lunch with right now who you may not have worked with before. How would you recommend yeah. um, our audience building a working relationship with you and other commissioners in general at the moment? Yeah, I think everyone's different, aren't they? I feel I'm quite open and honest. And I think that's for me, that's the, if we can have a proper conversation and say, look, this isn't happening, this isn't happening, you know, then for me, that works perfectly. So um, I guess I don't like it if I think, if I think people are giving me a bit of, Blarney, maybe. I kind of I've been known to text emojis to people in the meeting with me going, yeah, I don't don't believe this is true, you know, or etc. Um, but I like to think most people are great. And I think you appreciate people, even if you don't agree, or even if you don't like the idea, you really appreciate the person. So I, I kind of, for me, that's just ring me up. That's fine. You know, and, and let's talk. And I'm sure within the people that are listening in today, uh, we've probably got a lot of freelance APs, PDs, producers, runners, uh, even yeah. people from outside of the industry. They may have a great idea. How, how should they approach you? Do, do they need to be attached to a well-known production company? Um, what's the best way? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't actually 100% know the answer to that. I think um, it's something that's interesting with Channel 4. If, you, if an idea comes without a production company based with it, um, it's an interesting thing. I wonder if it's something we need to get a bit better at, actually. I don't, I don't know is the answer. I, but I'd, honest, I said I was honest. I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's best to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I think I think essentially to get something made, it does need to go to an independent production company. So I suppose um, there's two ways to do it. It's to start your own independent production company, which is, cannot be easy at all. Um, I did look into doing it myself once and I, and I didn't. <laughs> so maybe I'm not the right person to talk about that. But um, I think um, you can certainly sense check the idea. 
with as many people as you like and you can draw up the idea and then maybe uh, you could come to me and if it's interesting then probably as long as um, we, we would probably it might be then the case that we need to find a production company to attach to it because I think so basically things, get to know get to know indies research indies who yeah are the most well popular. yeah because I think you can have a brilliant idea and then the next stage is the production of the idea and I suppose if you don't have an edit suite or a camera or something like that you are going to need uh, and the finance and the paying and the insurance of course and the health and safety and all of those things that would need to come along with a network tv program you're probably at that point then going to need some help and and choose a production company that you get on with and that you like and you can trust and, and there, there is compromise that has to come down that line i'm afraid and if you hear an idea you like mm. what sort of time scale are you are we talking about to get it commissioned i mean i think it depends what it is i mean i know without without copping out really um i think the other thing we do for sports so for non-event programming let's say um you were going to make a program about um well let's say when we did the cricket world cup we also made a program about the 2005 ashes now the 2005 ashes became relevant because channel 4 was going to do cricket again and you can play that in front of the highlights of england australia so that comes about because of the the properties we've got so i would say if you're coming to pitch to channel 4 sport then you probably have a look at what channel 4 sport does and what works and you know if it's about cars you might want to say well this could go around the british grand prix or if it's about paralympic sport you would go around the paralympics or you know i mean i think it's all about looking what fits into the schedule and, and we have been burnt a little bit by putting on a program that is about something that we don't do and then not getting an audience to it can be a problem you know I think if you if you're sort of really going to do a program about uh, women's football for instance you know I would I would say the women's Euros is on the BBC and I would say you know yeah, you, you talk you would I would say come to us but I would also say go to the BBC because I think you know they will be wanting to upskill it all at that point that's their point of this program works particularly at this time for this thing um and i think you can save yourself a lot of uh time then actually because you know you, you will go to the right place to the people who are listening in the right place yeah and I, i'm very happy to share my email as well which is oh that's great uh yeah so it's it's just pandrews no dot uh p andrews but pandrews at channel4.co.uk so it's quite easy it's the guessing game as we were at the bbc people used to do the same guess name dot surname at bbc <laughs> you can have a crack at it if you know their name um some people used to get a one and two snuck in to avoid emails i didn't do that. it's very generous That's of you good. to share that pete thank you <laughs> can you can you give us it'd be really good to hear in more detail the steps that you have to take to get an idea commissioned i know that we touched upon it a bit but can you give us an idea about how um, many yeah. how many other people in order to get something yeah. lit? Yeah, so I mean I think the big surprise for me, the big surprise for me upon joining um was so I naively thought if I had a good idea and it was a programme, it was gonna be a programme. But actually it's not down to me i'm level one i suppose you know if we have a good sporting idea we would then take it to director of programs ian katz um or and or louisa compton who's now head of current affairs news and sport you know and essentially it then becomes incumbent on us to convince them that it should go in the schedule and our scheduling team who are great and often you know if we get an idea in and then we take three or four days to come back probably if we like it what we've done is we've tried over to schedules although we can't try over anymore we'll be emailing schedules saying look if we produce this where would you put it would you have a place for it would you have um something like that um because there's no point me loving an idea if they won't put it on air or if it doesn't work or if strategically it doesn't work or if it's in the middle of i think there was if there was an event i was really keen on doing early on when i came in and actually because of other stuff and and you know just fortuit unfortunately channel 4 already had stuff planned in those slots so you're in the point actually we can't do that because we're already doing this and that's a really good reason 
and so you have to say okay you know i don't have the overview the channel overview i have the strategy but i don't have the overview of what everyone else is doing which they do and um you know some things don't fit so you know we the job is then on me to get better at working out exactly what fits what to take in what levers to pull that what do they want and then i have to feed that back to the indies and say oh this this is what they want and then help advise people to get things commissioned so it's incumbent on me as well to be able to um give the right direction to get things done which is something you know as uh, since the start you have to get better at you know huge thank you to pete andrews and a huge thank you for ch to channel four as well for letting you spend uh, such a lot of time with us we've gone over apologies to that um pete you've given us a huge amount of insight everyone has commented on that you've been so honest funny and frank about what your job entails um so i really really appreciate that and it's really clear that everyone who's been here today has really appreciated that as well no well thanks for listening you know um you know apologies if i bored anyone at any point i think um you know it's a cha it's a challenging time at the moment and you know i think i think for everyone working in in the industry you know we really want to support everybody as best we can it's a really difficult time we understand that it's really difficult and and all around and let's hope it doesn't last too much longer um and we all come out the other side pretty soon i, I think I'm, I'm officially quite fed up of it now <laughs> i really you know <laughs> it's time to get back out there but so we'll let's see cross our fingers for this week but thank you very much and i hope to be able to have you back on again yeah sure absolutely